Hi everyone! Welcome to this tutorial on 3D Deep Learning with PyTorch 3D. My name is Nikhila Ravi and I'm a research engineer in the Facebook AI research team working on computer vision and 3D understanding. In this tutorial, I'll give you an overview of the PyTorch 3D library and then walk you through how to use several components, including code examples. In particular, I'll cover the data structures, common operations, such as data loading and transformations, loss functions, and differentiable rendering. Firstly, what is PyTorch 3D? It's a library of reusable components for state-of-the-art 3D deep learning research tasks. The goals of PyTorch 3D are to combine the features of a good deep learning library with the features needed for working with 3D data. A key focus throughout is efficiency, modularity, and differentiability. Several components have custom CUDA implementations for fast performance. In addition, most operators natively support heterogeneous batching of 3D data, such as batching meshes of different sizes. PyTorch 3D has pre-built packages for Anaconda and can be easily installed with a few commands. It has few external dependencies. You can find detailed installation instructions on the PyTorch 3D GitHub repository. This is an overview of the main components in the code base. The foundation layer consists of data structures for 3D data, data loading utilities, and composable transforms. The data structures in particular enable the operators and loss functions in the second layer to efficiently support heterogeneous batching. To start, let's look at the data structures for 3D data. We found that batching meshes and point clouds requires different batching strategies and the flexibility to be able to move from one representation to the other. Meshes takes as input the vertices and faces for a batch of meshes. You can start by defining a batch of meshes as a list of tensors. We can then easily switch to a packed representation, which is just a different view on the same data. With this representation, we need some auxiliary information, for example, the first indices into the packed tensor for each batch element. The packed representation is useful for operations like graph convolution. We might then need to reshape the vertices to add back in the batch dimension, and this involves padding the vertices based on the number of vertices of the largest mesh in the batch. The padded representation is useful for other operators like vertex line. We can see why this flexibility is important by looking at the architecture diagram, the Mesh RCNN, a paper from ICCV 2019, which is built using PyTorch 3D. The meshes data structure is used throughout and the representation of the vertices and faces in the batch is interchanged multiple times during the end-to-end -end loop. Here's a quick code example of how you can use the meshes data structure and easily switch between different views and also access other properties of the mesh. We start by importing meshes from the structures module. We can initialize a list of the vertices and faces of all the meshes in the batch as a list of tensors. We can then initialize the meshes class by calling the constructor with the list representations. We can switch to a different representation such as the packed representation by calling the appropriate method. And we can access the auxiliary tensors by calling their respective methods. Finally, we can access other computed properties of the mesh, such as the edges. Another set of common functions are loading utilities for 3D data and composable 3D transforms. A common task for almost all projects is loading data from file, for example, loading meshes. PyTorch 3D provides methods for loading meshes from OBJ files. Here, we load the vertices and faces and auxiliary information. The faces and augs variables are in fact named tuples, which contain a number of different variables. 
we can get the face indices using the Verts index key. The normals and texture information can be retrieved from the AUX tuple. In many cases, you will use the data from load OBJ to construct a meshes object. In this case, you can use the load OBJs as meshes function to directly load a mesh from file into a meshes object. The batched mesh is of type meshes, and in this example, contains a batch of three meshes. Transforming 3D data is another common task. PyTorch 3D has a general purpose transforms 3D class with subclasses to support different types of transforms. We can create separate translate and rotate transforms, both of which can be independently applied to a tensor of XYZ points, or they can also be composed to create one combined transform. You can also use the transform methods directly on the transforms 3D class. For example, here we have an XYZ scaling followed by an XYZ translation. Next, let's look at some of the optimized operators in PyTorch 3D. K nearest neighbors is a function that's used frequently with point clouds. Here we have two point clouds, P and Q. For a given point in cloud P, the goal is to find the K closest points in cloud Q. For example, k equals 5. In PyTorch 3D, we implement exact k and n with custom CUDA kernels that natively handle heterogeneous batches. Here's a quick code example. We import k and n points from the ops module. We can then initialize two random tensors and then call the k and n points method with the points and the desired value of k. Another operator which is used frequently with meshes is graph convolution. Each vertex in the mesh can have an associated feature vector, fi. Graph convolution computes new feature vectors for each vertex, propagating information along edges of the mesh. For one particular node, this involves two steps. One, gathering the features of all the adjacent nodes and summing them and two, adding them back to the node's own feature vector. The graphconv class is available in the ops module of PyTorch 3D. This can be initialized using the input and output dimensions, as well as the method of initialization for the weights tensors, and whether the graph is assumed to be directed or undirected. The graphconv function is then called with the verts and edges of the mesh. Next, Let's look at some of the loss functions available in PyTorch 3D. Chamfer loss is a method of comparing two sets of point clouds. For example, these points might be sampled from the surface of a mesh. Chamfer loss is used as a loss function in many 3D deep learning research tasks. For each point in set 1, we need to find the nearest neighbors in set 2 and then vice versa. Here is a quick example. We first import the chamfer distance function along with two helper functions, one to create a sphere mesh and another function to differentiably sample a point cloud from the surface of the mesh. We then initialize two spheres of different topologies and sample 5000 points from the surface of each of these meshes. Finally, we use these points to calculate the chamfer loss. Lastly, let's look at the differentiable rendering module in PyTorch 3D. What does having differentiable rendering step in a training loop mean? A 3D scene can be composed of a number of different components, including a mesh with textures, light sources, and a camera, which is the viewpoint from which the image is generated. Now, how do all these scene properties come into play in differentiable rendering? Each of these properties could be a variable which we want to learn. For example, the position of the camera, the intensity of the light, or the position of the mesh vertices. In the forward pass, we transform a mesh and pass it through a renderer to generate an image. The image might then be used as part of a loss function. We then want to propagate gradients back through the whole system and update the scene properties. This is where the renderer needs to be differentiable so we can learn the scene properties in an end-to-end -end way.
The PyTorch 3D renderer is split into two parts, a rasterizer and a shader. It can take as input a heterogeneous batch of meshes and associated textures. The first step inside the rasterizer is to use a camera to transform and project the input batch of meshes onto the 2D plane. The next step is the rasterization from which we output four intermediate variables for each pixel, which we call the fragment data. This includes the Z buffer, 2D Euclidean distance, barycentric coordinates, and the face indices. We also output not just the closest value, but the top K values for each of these variables. In the shader, we continue to keep the top K values while applying shading and texturing. And finally, in the blending step, aggregate across the top K values. The rasterization step is in CUDA for efficiency, but the rest of the pipeline is in PyTorch for increased modularity and ease of experimentation. Here is a quick example of how to set up a renderer with PyTorch 3D. We have more detailed examples in the tutorial section of the PyTorch 3D GitHub codebase. We first import the necessary components from the renderer module. Next, we need to initialize a camera, and here we use a perspective camera and the look at transform to determine the rotate and translate transforms. Next, we can initialize the rasterization settings which include the faces per pixel, which corresponds to the K parameter. So this determines the top K values which are returned from the rasterizer. For a full explanation of the parameters, please refer to the PyTorch 3D documentation. Next, we initialize a renderer by composing a rasterizer and a shader. There can be many different types of shaders, and it's also very easy to create your own. If the mesh or any of the scene properties had tensors with requires grad equals true, i.e. we want to learn this parameter, we can easily backpropagate through the entire system. For example, given a ground truth output image, we can calculate a loss and then directly call backward on the loss. The tutorials have more detailed examples of learning using the renderer. In the blending step, where we aggregate across the top K values, it's very easy to try different blending functions in PyTorch. The blending for this cube uses a softmax blending formulation from Soft Rasterizer, which can be written in a few lines of code in PyTorch. We have three different types of mesh texturing options, including vertex textures, vertex UV coordinates, and a texture map, and a texture atlas, where each face has its own small R cross R texture map. The texture type can be chosen based on your use case. Vertex textures are the simplest to implement. UV coordinates and texture maps enable more detailed textures, but are limited to one texture map per mesh. And finally, Texture Atlas allows representation of complex mesh textures, such as shape net meshes, which have multiple texture maps per mesh. I want to conclude by highlighting how you can get started with PyTorch 3D. On the GitHub repository, we have several tutorials which take you step by step through some example use cases. These tutorials can also be run with Google Colab, so you can try the code without having to download or install anything. The tutorials include 3D shape prediction, bundle adjustment, pose optimization, and textured mesh rendering from multiple viewpoints. Thanks a lot for listening. You can find the code on GitHub or also via the PyTorch 3D website, and there you can also find links to the documentation and tutorials. We hope you found this tutorial useful, and we look forward to seeing the project you build for the hackathon.